this is Gerd Leonhardt. Welcome to another edition of Meeting of the Minds. Today I have with me from Sydney, Australia, Ross Dawson, futurist, author, strategist and a good friend. Volume, variety and velocity. And this is the thing that's happening now with data, is that data is exploding from what it used to be with the information that people have at, at available at their fingertips and mobile devices. Now all of a sudden this volume is exponentially growing. So from, you know, we're, we're at the takeoff point from four to eight, not from four to five. Uh, so in, in a few years, it means basically a uh, common global data pool is going to be absolutely humongous. Financial information, personal information, health information, traffic information, sensor networks, all these things. So data is truly the new oil now, switching from the energy economy to the data economy. That's driving lots of businesses and lots of companies are looking at this and saying, how can this actually change what we do and how will it change what we do? Education, banking, research, media, essentially being data driven. Big data is making big differences between how effective organizations and individuals are. So Eric Brynjolfsson of MIT says that did a study which shows that those organizations that do what he called data-driven decision-making have five to six percent higher productivity than those organizations that don't. Uh, so there's a big divide now between those organizations that are able to capture and to analyze and define the insights and make better decisions from data compared with those organizations that don't. As individuals, you know, this idea of the quantified self, we can learn far more than ever before about what we are eating and when we are eating and what exercise we do and how we are sitting and what media we're receiving and how we are sleeping, all of which enables us to make better decisions, to act better so that we can be healthier. And that data can not just help individuals and organizations to be more effective and make better decisions, they can actually help them to know more about themselves. I think we're finding that computer systems actually often know more about individuals than they know about themselves, about their preferences and what they like. So the potential of this is extraordinarily valuable, though clearly we also need to take into mind the implications for privacy. Big data potential has been clarified, I think, by McKinsey to be in the neighborhood of four to eight trillion dollars economy a year in, in by 2025. Uh, I think one of the real issues with, with the uh, collection, the use of data, of course, is the fact that it turns a lot of things into algorithms. So we can be quantified how valuable we are to our employer. We can be quantified how valuable we are to society, whether we should receive a, a money to do X, Y, Z, how valuable our art is, and so on and so on. So it makes things quantifiable, which in turn makes us quantifiable. So, so one of the issues of big data is how do we stay human uh, on top of this pool of data that gives lots of objective, uh, supposedly objective information, so we don't end up with, a call, with a call, what I call uh, bullshit algorithms like cloud that use a, a bad algorithm to describe something that isn't actually working. So for me, big data has a lot of upside, but it also really needs some sort of way of humanifying, humifying, you could say, make it, making it human so that we can actually get a result from it that fits us rather than us fitting the result. One of the massive domains of explosion of data is social data. And we, till not very long ago, we had almost no data about what people felt about each other, how they interacted, how they communicated, the value they placed on each other. So the social media, as we're experiencing and the way it's growing, is giving us extraordinary amounts of information about, amongst other things, how uh, reputable a person is, how good are they, what they do, are they somebody you'd want to go out on a date with, are they uh, somebody you would trust to do business with. And we're still at the beginning of really what's this big explosion. Part of that is going to give us the, the, the beginnings of this true reputation economy, one where we are aggregating extraordinary amounts of data that we never had before. How much people look at the eye when they meet uh, is part of that data set. So the challenge is that this reputation data will always be flawed. It will never be right. People place a lot of trust in it, and it will be valuable. But we do have to be cautious about where these numbers lead us. There's one really big issue about data, and this issue is the uh, big data, big brother issue. Clearly, because as humans, we tend to value hard information and numbers and uh, knowledge and science as being, you know, the truth in parentheses. Well, we don't trust so much the other part, which is intuition or feelings or, you know, philosophy or whatever. So the problem with big data is that it amplifies this left brain thinking that, you know, now that we have the data, we can clearly say that this is the best fit to be my future wife you know, based on DNA and all these things, right? And of course, when you think this through, it's, it's 
quite ridiculous in that we're leaving out, you know, we're using this data, but we're not using the sentiment, you know, the actual thing in between the data. Uh, and this is one of the big issues about data-driven economies, is that it puts us all into neat little boxes, and then we have to perform according to the box. Right? And, and this is, I think this is one of the major challenges going forward, is to use that data, but uh, there are lots of factors that will make it, you have to amplify it in a human way. Otherwise, we have to actually perform according to the data. But the and question so is on. why and how do we need this? For example, there's an app that allows me to monitor if my baby's diaper is wet. Right, so the diaper has, a, has a, a, a chip in it. The chip says, I am wet, send a message to my iPhone, the baby has a wet diaper. Enough to worry about this basically saying that doesn't, doesn't a, a mother know when it's time to change the diaper anyhow? Or are they miles away doing something else? I mean, this is kind of a bizarre thing when we start needing those things. It's like we're going to create that little bubble to do something that we could do just as well without the bubble, just for the purpose of creating a business. I think sometimes we can say, you know, these are things which we can do perfectly well ourselves, which we will get computers to do. I mean, the use of calculate, we don't, we, uh, we are very good, uh, very poor at uh, mental arithmetic now because calculators can do that. So we can outsource some of the tasks which were done before. Others we can actually get better at, for example, now we have rain alerts. We can know when the, uh, the rain is coming. We don't have to keep on looking out the window to see where the clouds are coming. We can say, all right, the rain's coming. I need to take in the laundry. So we can get more information to be able to uh, run our lives better. It's, there clearly is a risk that we can start becoming too dependent on that. Well, the question is, where do you draw the line? You know, for me personally, of course, I'm, I'm 52, I'm not 15, but I'm worried about you know, people drawing the line pretty much nowhere so that whatever comes along will do. You know, so right now we, we can get a, an implant to hear better or, or, or to see better, of course, a cataract or whatever, and, and people can do that. But very soon I can get a Wikipedia implant. Uh, and I'm advantaged writing my, uh, you know, speaking to an audience because I have a Wikipedia implant, you don't. You don't. So you're not as good as I am in, in parentheses because you don't. And that leads eventually leads to the matrix or leads to real science fiction scenarios to where I'm worthless because I'm not beefed up. And, and, and so the, and that has a lot to do, I think, with this question of ethics and, of course, the question of uh, the technology imperative, you know, because basically what we're seeing right now, and uh, we we'll be wondering what you think about this, is that we're creating a very large matrix of uh, services and platforms that are all benefiting from this and generating new businesses from this, you know, the, the data economy. Right? So does it actually have use for us or does it actually mostly have use for those that are providing it to us? I think one of the big factors in the future of humanity is that divergence between those who choose to augment themselves with technology and connect and be all, you know, meshed in the matrix and those who choose not. And it's a perfectly valid choice to say, okay, I don't want to be connected all the time. I don't want to plug my brain into different things. Yet, clearly, those people that choose to take that path, the, supposedly the, the old human path, have a massive disadvantage to those people that choose to take that other path. There are choices to be made, and I think that the, the reality is those who take the choices of moving away from the potential of technology to augment themselves are simply going to uh, certainly be massively economically disadvantaged. Well, this so is it's the, possible to live a richer life. This is the Amish thing, right? I mean, are, those, are they disadvantaged because they don't use cars? I, I think they are. They don't think they are, but they're certainly not uh, the mainstream. <laughs> and, and the problem is, I think this is a really matrix problem. I'm going to be on the grid or off the grid. And I can't be on LinkedIn, for example, and receive your ping about a deal uh, at the same time where I don't fill out my profile, I don't put anything in, you won't ping me. So me not being as open is a disadvantage. And then sooner or later, me not being connected or have it, having the Wikipedia implant is a disadvantage. And sooner or later, not having an electronic arm that can lift a car is a disadvantage. And so who gets to do all these things? You know, is there, it creates also massive inequality because if I have lots of money, I can beef myself up. So two divergences. One is the choice. So there are some people who make the choice. I do want to take every advantage of every technology possible or saying, no, that's too much. I want to get off. I just want to remain as I was born. The other one is in terms of wealth. There are so many possibilities that are coming only to those who have sufficient wealth. One of the most pointed of those examples is longevity. So I think that there is a lot of promising techniques and technologies to be able to extend our lives almost certainly they will be very, very expensive. Insurance companies certainly won't want to pay for them. Okay, so big data is a very real phenomenon. As I say, data is the new oil. 
if, if this actually happens and we have by 2025 we have a, a five to seven trillion dollar uh, data economy as, as McKinsey has projected, how do we get from here to there? You know, what do you think companies need to do today so that they can actually use this concept of the data economy? A few, few basic stages for companies. One is identify not just what data is the ones they uh, currently can get, but also what they could get. What are the data which could be valuable? Be able to make sure that that is all tagged at source, to be able to filter that. One of the really critical things is getting the data analysis effectively. And I think more and more that's going to go to crowdsourcing. Not every company can get the pool of data scientists internally. So being able to get the mechanisms where you can crowdsource the analysis of that data. But the biggest single challenge, I think, and what organizations need to develop as a capability is how do you get from the insights from big data to better decisions and better actions? And that's a very human and cultural aspect. I think there's few organizations that are good, even that are good at data analysis, to really taking that to better decisions. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, just to add on to this, I think the, uh, the idea of what's happening with data being like oil, when I take it out and I mine it and I slice and dice it, that's the intelligence, but I still can't drive it. And if I don't have a license, I don't get to use the gas. So to me, the, uh, what companies need to do is to create a sense-making mechanism from this data because most of the data mining and the uh, slicing and dicing will be done by software agents and machines and robots like IBM Watson or so and, and they're far superior on the speed of this. But the sense making and, and taking all this data and saying don't pay attention to this, pay attention to that and, and you know this is a, a distinctly intuitive imaginary, you know, a, basically a composition process you could say in my view. Uh, and this is going to be our work as humans in the future. We're not going to do that digging stuff anymore. <laughs> right? so I think for a lot of jobs that, that means that they're going to merge over into the creative part, into the uh, sense making. And most companies will actually not sell the software. The software will be free. Uh, essentially, they will sell the sense making around it. Uh, I and think this is part of this whole domain of the shift of where is the human value? And there's still, the humans are good at either making decisions or checking decisions. And so the computers can be good at the analysis, but flowing through the human part. So it's how do you, it's in a way, it's this issue of how do you bring the humans and the qualities of the humans, the creativity and the imagination, the decisions together with that data. Yeah, there, there's, I think there's a key trend here in saying that, uh, I mean, we can observe essentially that computers were never good enough to do this. Now they are, and they're getting to be good enough. We can talk to them, they can translate us, they can, they can measure our electronic streams, they can prick our blood and do all these things, right? So now they're getting good enough, now we, we should let them do all that manual stuff and all that crunching stuff. And we have to evolve to the next level, letting go of the crunching stuff, right? And, and focus on what we do when it's already crunched. So rather than being the ones digging out the oil or refining it, we should be the one driving the car you know, deciding where to go. And this is a whole different cup of tea. Most companies don't understand that they have to get out of this business of mining because basically the software will take that over completely. And hopefully this whole point, what this brings us to is where there's more power to the people. Exactly. So this concludes today's episode of Meeting of the Minds. Thanks very much to Ross Dawson for being part of this today. If you want to know more about the show, you can go to meetingoftheminds.tv. We are also taking questions and inputs for the next show. Just use the Twitter hashtag Meeting of the Minds and we'll be responding and trying to work your comments into our next show. Thanks very much for joining us.